or no? Yes? Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, today we will talk about continuous professional development. Uh, thank you Claire and Maria Luisa for last week's presentation. Today's presentation, first we will talk about for about 40 minutes uh, in our presentation and during the presentation you can send your questions and at the end we will have 20 minutes to answer your questions. Yes, so let's continue with the next slide. Um, as you can see, let's develop a special webinar for you. Um, my name is Eduard Kremers. I've been an English teacher for about 11 years now. Um, I've been training teachers for seven years, uh, online and face-to-face. -face. And I uh, also teach business English, uh, coach, directors, um, and I would like to introduce Renate Blum. Thank you very much, Edward. <clears throat> well, good <coughs> afternoon, everybody. We're pleased to be here. It's a privilege to have been invited. And Edward just mentioned how he became an English teacher and his specialties. Well, <clears throat> I guess everybody has a different story. And uh, I'm... I think that I fall into teaching uh, by accident. Later on, I'll tell you why and how. I've been teaching for several decades. My experience has been great. And uh, currently, I am teaching face-to-face -face courses and online as well, and mostly devoted to teacher training. Uh, and I am also a member of the panel to certify teachers at Ceneval. I love what I do and I think you share this feeling with me. Thank you, Edward. Okay, so um, now I suggest we go to the, to the next slide. And the next slide says, uh, continuous professional development, why? So first, the first question, why did you become an English teacher? As uh, Renate said, she became an English teacher by accident. In my case, it was, um, it was a real choice. I've been working at uh, companies before, but then I decided to become an English teacher and take diplomas and continue from there on. And the next question, um, why continuing professional development? It can be because you're a novice teacher and once you just finished your teacher's course, you think you know it all and you start teaching. But then as you notice that the students do not respond the way as you expect them to respond. A lot of problems arise and you don't know how to deal with those problems. So then a continuous development uh, sets in and maybe Renata can say about, a bit more about that. Well, I would like to share with you why I turned to, well, I became an English teacher by accident and it was because at that time, which was a long time ago, I needed to earn some money. And the only thing I thought I could do well was to speak English. So I started teaching English empirically with no diplomas, nothing. And later on, I faced the need to become a true professional or a more professionally uh, guided teacher. We like acronyms when we uh, use English and we use words like TBL, like PBL, like CLIL. And here we have CPD. But what is CPD, Continuous Professional Development? In the next slide... Uh, so, sorry to, to interrupt. Um, another, another reason for continuous, um, continuous professional development is because nowadays there's an increased demand on qualified teachers. In the early days, you could go away with just knowing English and being a teacher but now um, but today 
uh, institutions ask for qualified teachers, you need at least a teacher's ISILT or a bachelor's degree. So there are several programs to train the teachers and help them become more professional. And on top of that, um, today we also need to address the 21st century skills because uh, our students need to be competent and able to, uh, to communicate in this uh, new era in which technology plays a big part. And also the, the contact with different cultures is, is much more widely than before. So um, teaching uh, the teachers about culture and the teacher passing that knowledge on to their students helps the students to become like globally competent uh, learners. And once they uh, go into the companies, they, they have got tools in order to communicate effectively without upsetting uh, their counterpart. Okay, and okay, but what exactly is CPD? What do we mean by continuous professional development? In the next slide, we will be able to see different ideas. And here we have a few. Any professional, any profession needs updating. Let's make an analogy. A physician. A physician 20, 30 years ago without being updated. Will this physician know about the, the new equipment, the new tools to operate on more efficiently? Well, the same, exactly the same happens in our profession. English needs updating. Teachers of English need to be in this era. And it is our own responsibility to develop ourselves day by day. And I would uh, finish uh, saying that it is an essential part of professionalism and also include ethical issues. What do you think about, uh, are there any different types of uh, CPD or continuous professional development, Edward? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we just mentioned in this slide uh, some of them because there are many, many. So, but the very most important uh, type of CPD, I would say, is reflection. Reflection on your teaching because reflection needs to become a habit because you teach a class and you think like, okay, what went well? That's always nice to know. But more importantly, what did not go so well? Mm -hmm. And then what can I do about it? So reflection on your own teaching is really important and you should make it a habit. Um, another type of continuous professional development, I would say is the, uh, attending uh, webinars, um, Congresses. So in Mexico now nowadays there are more uh, yearly uh, congresses that you can attend, and you get few points of many many different teachers, and you get other input, other viewpoints. So that's really enriching for your classes. So you get a lot of ideas attending those um, those conferences, and. Uh, also very important is exchanging ideas. So exchanging ideas with your coworkers. So at school, please talk to your, to your peer uh, English teachers, ask their opinions, how they tackle uh, certain problems, if they have got tips, how to, in how to incorporate different techniques. And if they, if they face behavioral problems of the students, how they address that. And um, I don't know if you would like to continue with the next one. Well, another <coughs> tool or another type of continuous professional development is the power and the richness of observation. And here we have formal 
observation that can be that can be done by authorities, by the school, uh, by the school staff, uh, but that is uh, qualified to do that. They need training to observe, mm -hmm. and very valuable now in courses is peer observation. When teachers observe other teachers and they can reflect on their own learning while they watch some others doing their, their teaching or, or having their teaching there. And we have uh, this idea of sharing, sharing uh, not only what we do well, and you just mentioned sharing what doesn't go too well. I believe in positive feedback, constructive uh -huh. feedback, and that helps us a lot to become better. I was, I was uh, talking about this analogy of the physician and using new tools, using new equipment, and uh -huh. I forgot something very important, Edward. I forgot the theory behind the practice. A real professional backs up every decision taken while he or she is teaching with some theoretical background, the schools of thought, authors who have established approaches, who have established certain uh, thoughts in learning that will tell us why we do things why we shouldn't do certain things and take new decisions and probably mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. yes absolutely and for example to go back at peer observation um, if you are observed <laughs> if you're being observed by the authorities the coordinator uh, or the head teacher you tend to get more nervous and uh, your performance is much less than when you would have a peer that comes to observe you. And the, um, I would highly recommend that people engage more in peer observation because then you help each other, you exchange your viewpoints, and um, as a team, you become much stronger and much, much more competent. And the authorities of the school will really welcome that because it means that their team of teachers is really solid and uh, always tries to to improve themselves and as you said risk taking it's really um, a part of becoming better because always going on the safe side it leads to boring classes like repeating every time the same and the same because it worked uh, one year ago 10 years ago but maybe this year it doesn't I had teachers like that who would repeat <laughs> and not evolve and not risk. But Edward, how do you feel when being observed? Mm, I, feel, I feel nervous, but I also know that in the end, people will give me some feedback that I can use uh, in order to become a better teacher. And I think it's also very important for the for the students to know that their teachers are also human and they need continuously to, to improve. And if the students see that the teacher teachers make an effort to become better, it also is a stimulus for, um, uh, for the students to mm -hmm. go the extra mile because they see their teacher being really engaged. The teacher really cares for uh, their students and to deliver quality. So, Peer observation, official observation are really key elements in continuous professional development. Is there a cycle that you could mm. uh, talk <coughs> about on continuous professional yes. development? Good question. Let's go to the, to the next slide. Uh, that's the COPES cycle. And that's like the keystone of the, the continuous development. So it's not only for related to teaching, but to any profession to become better. So the first part of the cycle is the concrete experience. So it's, as you can read, doing, having an experience. So you deliver the class, 
uh, you experience the class, you see the reaction of the students, and that's the concrete experience. Could you call it the hands-on? Yes, the hands-on. So you're really performing it and yeah, seeing what is, what is the result. So after the class, I would suggest shortly after the class, there, there comes the part of reflective observation. So in the part of reflective observation, you think about, as I mentioned before, the things that went well, because it's really important uh, to re reflect upon what went well, but also why did those things go well? What, what element um, managed uh, the, the, th the things to go, to go well? And on the other hand, things that did not go well or completely wrong. And then you have to think, why did it go wrong? Why did the students respond completely differently than I expected? So that's the reflective part and a real important part. Would that lead on um, ways to <coughs> improvement? Yes. If you're honest? You should, well, as you reflect on your class you, and you're alone, you can be completely honest because you do not need to share it with anybody. And uh, it's not only reflecting because reflecting what went well, what went wrong, and leave it like that, that would cut the circle and yeah, don't, don't lead to improvement. So what you actually need to do is abstract conceptualization. So in this stage, <clears throat> you conclude and you learn from what's, yeah, what went well, what did not go well, and you make a plan of action. So what should I do in order to change that's that's um, those aspects so once you have got that and the next time the next time that you have to teach this part um, you you teach it and it's like active experimentation so here you're taking risks because you get out of, of your comfort zone things that you knew that more or less worked and you take risks in order to see if the new approach really helps. So once you experimented that, then you teach it the following time. And it's again, the concrete experience uh, from where the, um, uh, the cycle uh, repeats itself. I know that many courses are <coughs> encouraging teachers to try out innovative ways of teaching new proposals. At the end of, of the talk, we will present some of those. <clears throat> but I guess that we need to risk ourselves and become uh, more active in changing and more active in taking decisions, but knowing always why we do things. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's, uh, let's check the, the next slide. And I would ask you to, to continue with this. So how you can check it with the framework. Okay, I'll, I'll be quick uh, explaining this, this chart. And uh, I would start asking the audience, where are you? In what stage are you? What doubts have you got? And yes. If, if you sorry. Sorry. Yes. So, um, uh, meaning with what's what's my stage? Mm -hmm. Actually, there are like six stages. We will see that in the next slide. Okay. Thank Starting you. Starting from yeah, the most basic to the most experienced. Yes. Thank you very much for reminding me about uh, this uh, differentiation of the stages. But when you know what stage you are, if you are very active in this change, in this uh, innovative process, in this progress of your own profession, you start planning. Mm -hmm. You start asking questions. What do I need to develop? How can I develop it? Maybe we don't have the answers. And then we need others. 
to help us. We need networks or training or resources. We can find anything in the internet, but we can also find in the internet things that will not lead us to acknowledgeable websites. So we have to be careful about what we find there and what will be relevant and what will help us to become more efficient. And then we can go forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So let's continue with the following slides in which we will highlight a bit more the, the stages that are there. So as I as already mentioned, there are six stages and the first stage is starting. So in this stage, uh, teachers are actually trainee teachers. So they are not teachers yet, not certified, but they are giving some classes as part of, of, the, of the training program. So at this stage, everything is new and yeah, you're kind of blank regarding teaching and everything mm -hmm. is a bit scary at first, I can tell you. <laughs> and then you've got the newly qualified or the novice teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, at this stage, as I already mentioned, that you finished the, the teacher's course and yeah, you can start teaching, but then you actually experience real life and you get slammed um, several times. So then you decide on uh, keep on studying and then you will get in the developmenting, uh, developing stage in which you're not a novice teacher anymore, but you, you gain some knowledge, you've read several authors, you came across the schools of uh, thought, for example, constructivism, behaviorism, and then you start to realize that uh, there's much more to do with learning than just teaching a lesson, giving them some language, some exercises, and the rest will do itself. No, that's absolutely not the case. And the higher you get in the developmental stage, the more competent you are at addressing the real needs of the students. Because um, like standardized programs do not work for all the students. So at different uh, schools, uh, you need different types of, uh, of English. So that's also based on ESP, English for specific purposes. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have a technical um, career, then you need to study uh, technical English. If, and if you're studying for a lawyer, you need to study legal English as well. So those aspects, you will, you will uh, become more familiar with that the higher you get in the developmental stage mm -hmm. of, of this um, uh, grid. Yes, and, and you can continue. And <coughs> uh, we have uh, the fourth stage, which is the proficient stage, and then the advanced, and then the specialist stage. And uh, again, I would like to ask everybody, what stage do you think you belong to? Are we specialists, Edward? No. Have we reached that stage already? I wish I could say yes, but once you reach, for example, the specialist stage, in this time and era, the, uh, everything goes so fast that if you're a specialist now, in a couple of months, that is already a bit outdated. So we always need to keep on studying and trying to, to be at the latest trends. So you would say that it is a continuum. Yes, I think you and never, never reach, stop. Yes, I think you never reach number six. So the specialist stage, you can tip it and I leave knew, it. I, I know a few specialists and I admire them highly. I don't know if, if we'll ever reach that level and if we need it. But anyway, let's see what comes yes, in the future. Uh, I would like to tell the audience that we're not reading the whole slides, but we, at the end, you, you will have our emails and you can ask us, us for this presentation. What yes. about that, Edward? That's, that's a good idea. And any additional question that will not be addressed at the end, you can send an email to, to either of us 
and we will go back to you and respond your your queries. Yes, and and the, in the presentation we have the websites where we took the information from because being ethical means also to acknowledge. Yes, uh, they are in the slides as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Edward, we mentioned that we would we would talk about certain proposals, not everything because in 40 minutes it's impossible. But are there any new proposals or new wor ways that you would like to talk about that are currently taking place? Yes, there are a lot of changes <laughs> right now. Let's continue to the next slide. Um, it says new ways to teaching 21st century skills. I already mentioned that. And as you can see, it says blended learning. So blended learning is, is a, well, in Mexico, it's the latest trend that you combine face-to-face -face, uh, classes with an internet, mm -hmm. an online environment. So uh, blended, it, as you can see, uh, it says online, offline. So if you are working on a computer, it can be that you're uh, watching a lecture uh, online and later on you're writing a report regarding what you saw in the lecture and that you can do offline so that's the online offline in the virtual you, you can see anytime anywhere anyhow sometimes if I can't sleep at night I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I decide to work a bit on the online courses that I'm delivering that's the great thing of online courses. Or, asynchronic. Yes, is <laughs> asynchronic. That's also one of the biggest benefits of blended learning. Uh, another uh, benefit of blended learning is that students can um, read an article three, four, five times, the times necessary uh, for them to really understand what they have to read. Um, there's also the face-to-face -face element. So with blended learning, you can ask the students to, uh, to watch a lecture <laughs> and in class, you can have them discuss about the lecture that they saw. And that's, um, that works great because you have got much more time uh, for that. So let's continue with the following slide. That hey, can, I, can I, sorry, can I, yes. can I add something? You, you, you're talking about new ways to teaching and 21st century skills or fluencies. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would like to, to mention just a few of them, like collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is one of these uh, 21st century skills which will enable students to be better citizen. And when, whenever they are working, they will have this teamwork uh, knowledge and experience and also the use of technology. What would happen if you and I did not know about all these technological changes? It has changed my life completely. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't believe in online teaching. I know. <laughs> because I thought that I needed to see the students, to touch them, to feel them. But now I sense them online. Then another of the century skills would be critical thinking. Mm -hmm. We want critical thinkers. We want people to uh, use their brains and continuously to ask if what we are doing is right, if what they're reading about is true, and to, to ask many, many things and to become autonomous learners independent learners and i guess that part of this is to guide our teaching to the student a student-centered approach and less teacher -centered. TTT, the teacher talking time what do you think about that yes absolutely and one of the aspects that you mentioned the the collaborative learning um, as i teach a lot in companies and coach uh, directors what I sensed that uh, nowadays in companies, they've got more project-based uh, working. So people are working in a team of four or eight people together 
and they need to communicate. So if in the school they they learn how to uh, how to work together on projects, it helps them to to work better in companies. Um, also, what you what you said about the the constructive learning, uh, they they learn how to form their own opinion. So they they learn how to reason instead of memorizing information and repeating that uh, in an exam because that was the old school method that students had to to learn uh, a text memorize it and if they could answer all the questions that was great and now the questions are more like what uh, what do you think the author's opinion is about the the topic at hand so it's more constructive so with the blended learning uh, comes along flipping the classroom this we can see in the next slide okay i will go to the other slide sorry yeah so here you see uh, flipped classrooms so what you do in flipping the classroom it's a form of blended learning so you uh, put the homework site uh, before the class that um, that helps you in several ways because when you teach a lesson most of the times you you lose up to 80 percent of the time in class in instructions having the students read or listen to to a um, to a lecture and you only can focus 20 percent you can dedicate 20 percent of your time to to reveal activities in class so when you flip the classroom you've got all of a sudden that's 80 percent more or less time available so they read at home they watch the lecture at home and the weaker students also have more benefit more from it because they can read more often okay yeah they can read more often and um well, once they come to class they've got the same level of knowledge and then if everybody has got an equal starting point on which you can develop the class uh, further i read about flipping the classroom and at first it was something that i i hardly could understand and this was born when they face problems t math, math math teachers face problems that they could not teach math so efficiently and then they started risking and started trying to discover new methodologies and then they started working with this flipped classroom or flipping the classroom idea and it's worked for them but is it happening in english mm. is it happening in mexico yes it's um, not on a big scale but there are institutions that already are experimenting with flipping the classroom and they really benefit from it and uh, what you need is to see uh, to take several things into account because in rural areas um, most of the times the socio-economic level is much lower so pe people do not have a computer at home or do not have internet at home the students don't have an ipod so flipping the classroom also requires uh, the students and the parents to be at the social economic level that allows them to have the, at least internet a computer at home so that they're able to um, to base the lesson upon uh, flipping the classroom i i don't know if you've seen sugata mitra he opened he was the keynote speaker in the last ayatefo and now mm -hmm. he's got a wonderful talk in the TED, TED, if you, if you mm -hmm. uh, check yes, it in the website. And he's got this great idea of a school in the cloud. And in India, he said different computers and kids were very curious. And they, they went and they started learning from the computers. And then he thought about people helping these kids and they were grannies, retired people would don't mi don't miss watching it again in the TED or mm -hmm. in the I IATEFO 
uh, opening ceremony, the, the keynote mm -hmm. speech. Yes, and for example, um, um, yeah, with flipping the classroom, you incorporate uh, certain um, technical tools. And uh, for example, with the activities at home, it can be that um, you just watch a lecture. So that will, would be like basic input, but you can also have the LMS. And that is when you use a, a platform like, uh, for example, Schoology or Moodle, there you design activities for the students because when you ask them to watch a lecture at home, you don't always know if they're really watching the lecture. Yes, so, who supervises. Yes, that's, and with those platforms, you can say, okay, you have to write um, an essay of, for example, 50 words to, to give your opinion about the lecture. Mm -hmm. And you upload it at that, uh, at that specific place because you design one place that you say, okay, upload assignment mm -hmm. uh, lecture about, uh, uh, for example, renewable energy. And you can also uh, ask the students to, to go on a platform and uh, to interact uh, on the platform. And you put, for example, as the, as the tutor, you place several questions in the forum and invite the students to give their opinion and the students themselves interact with each other in order to see what they think about it. And it has to be supervised by the teacher mm -hmm. uh, in order to prevent uh, bullying, that people get mm -hmm. hostile to, to one another. So that's one thing you have to be very careful with, that everything has to be supervised. Mm -hmm. And then in the next slide, I think we can answer why we're proposing the flipped or the flipping classroom and also blended learning. Well, we already mentioned <coughs> autonomy, becoming independent. Students have more control over their own learning, but supervised and guided. We have become more facilitators, guides, experts, we still need to be there. Teachers will not, will not uh, disappear from the earth. No, and, I absolutely agree. And, but <clears throat> we should be more open and aware of learning taking place in different ways. And the technological competencies is something that uh, we need to keep on. And uh, we know that uh, very quickly things are uh, appearing. And we have uh, things like the spider web, like uh, the the word, uh, how do you how do you call that, where you can you can mix words, the word Kindle. I, I cannot mm, remember, um, but there are many 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 uh, pieces of software that have done uh, learning more attractive because there's lots of color, lots of innovation, and lots of ways of presenting it. And uh, do you know about any other additional ideas to keep up? Maybe in the next slide we can show that. Okay. Yes, and um, for example, as you as you already mentioned, uh, teachers are <coughs> are more aware of learning taking place. So in the forums, um, when you check the discussion, you have um, yeah much faster. You grasp if students really learned because you read all the con all the discussion and you see all the students at once because in the old context you you uh, checked one assignment then another then another and you didn't get that uh, interactive competence with the among the students so the interpersonal skills and the intrapersonal skills are also more developed uh, among the students yes and you have evidence yes and developing and progress like using portfolios which would be another topic yeah and for example having students work more together it helps them also to to stand up more for themselves mm. because in the old context that um, in the teacher centered classes that the students were like passive mm -hmm. the students didn't develop 
um, their own their own meaning so they couldn't um, develop their, those skills so let's have let's you got continue. other ideas uh, that was my my question if you have additional ideas to 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 keep yourself update as a teacher yes we also have some uh, we've put some ideas in the next slide um for example um take an acknowledged elt course so besides uh, surfing the web yourself if you have some problems for example with behavioral issues in the classroom that you say mm, let me check if other teachers have got uh, similar issues so you you type in the yeah the search engine uh, problematic students english class and then you will be surprised at the number of hits of articles from people that that talk about it they give you some tips how to go about this type of behavior so you can also take uh, acknowledged elt course nowadays there there is a vast uh, range of elt courses online face to face but it's growing uh, online we are both uh, teachers <laughs> teachers uh, online uh, abroad so we are global online teachers we've got a project in chile we are teaching in mexico so uh, all around the country so that's a really great experience for us but also for the teachers taking those courses and can you mention some other well i am a ideas. i am a member of a panel at ceneval and it's great to see teachers who did not have an opportunity to do uh, a, a complete a major, a complete uh, university program, like five years, but they're <coughs> highly experienced, and most, uh, and some of them are really, uh, they 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 have all the ELT knowledge, and they would be certified as undergraduate teachers, and that's a great opportunity. Of and course, are there courses for that uh, to prepare yes, yourself? Yes, there are many courses. There are many uh, institutions in Mexico who prepare who prepare teachers and uh, <clears throat> other ways of keeping yourself up to date <coughs> is reading a lot reading elt stuff there mm -hmm. are many e-newsletters you can still be su subscribed to different uh, to different elt acknowledged uh, journals and or belong to forums like the English language teaching contact scheme, the acronym is LTEX. LTEX LAC stands for Latin America. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can all, you can also belong to other forums like the Cambridge Forum, One Stop English, Oxford Forums. There are many. And we have uh, the last question, any other? Well, any other, maybe, maybe the audience can feed us with other ideas to keep up to date because mm -hmm. we, we're still finding out lots of things and we need we need everybody to share the ideas with us. Yes, and there are also um, online online pages that you can learn English. And as you, if you are a teacher, you can work as a volunteer to yeah to answer queries from uh, from students that are doing the exercises and have got some grammar issues. Uh, or they say, well, I wrote an essay, can someone check my essay? And uh, there are pages that, that do that. And I work also as a um, volunteer under a different name, <laughs> uh, but I help the students out because that page is uh, aimed at teachers with low budgets, so they don't have the money to pay for themselves for the courses. So they can go to the page and That's yeah, you can there. help them out. That's very nice that you do pro bono things. And I think every professional should devote some time to those who are who, who cannot afford that. Let me yes. show you a slide that I was sent about teacher development sessions. This is from uh, X Enterprise. I, I, did, I, I did not, I deleted the name of the enterprise. But have a look, it says teacher development sessions, February 2015. And here they call themselves 
joint international network of holistic schools and teachers and and then they add different different uh, things and uh, here it's specialized to 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 some kids and it's in buenos aires argentina uh, there are other uh, teacher development possibilities elsewhere and we are we are global what's global well we are local we're locally here in mexico but we're global as well and that's what we we can call as carol Lethaby calls global mm -hmm. i think we have localized ourselves and uh, we need we need to start uh, answering some of the, of yeah, the of questions the... but first um, Okay. Yes. Yeah, so first, thank you very much uh, for yeah for listening to our part. Uh, it was a pleasure to to be able to share our viewpoints and our knowledge regarding this topic. And now we would like to address the questions from the audience. Okay. In in the slide in the thank you slide you have our emails, and we gladly would like to share the presentation if you want it just send us an email and we'll email you this presentation we already have two questions and a comment uh, and one of the question is, is this in service development by angelica flores mm. are we are we talking about in service development as well uh yes mainly about in service but as i already mentioned the um, the first stage is the the novice teacher so the teacher in training so uh, when you come from nothing you start taking the teacher's course and you start giving some classes as part of uh, as part of your training so uh, the cpd is, is covers the whole range the whole schema yeah the whole All range the stages yeah um, there are different courses as you say and for instance, uh, the ISELT is an in-service course. And uh, it's great that uh, teachers, already teachers, are teaching. Mm -hmm. They are learning about new methods, learning about new techniques, and about new group interaction patterns. And, uh, and they can apply these uh, ideas immediately, hands-on immediately, mm -hmm. and check if they're risking well or if they are not risking too well yeah so it's it's actually for for all all the levels okay so the next question i want to obtain a place as an english teacher for the next school cycle i'm using different online resources and retaking again my intermediate courses to clarify any doubts can you give any other advice for my preparation and to be ready for my purpose? Okay, that's from Jasmine. Um, well, um, you say, okay, um, yes, you're retaking, okay, you've, so you've taken intermediate courses, mm -hmm. but you want to become a teacher. That's what, um, that's what I understand from that. Uh, there are several institutions in Mexico that offer uh, teacher teacher courses that are like crash courses, and uh, you can take them within three months or two months. Uh, that would be an idea, but not all institutions uh, take teachers um, uh, on board that only have the teachers. So at the beginning, it can be a bit uh, difficult but a teacher diploma helps you a lot and um yeah we can we cannot mention the authors because then we would yes yeah, or that, the institutions offering yeah. offering those services nevertheless just mean i would i would ask you to check which institutions you would like to work at and then ask those institutions what qualification you need what are what is the minimum requirement minimum qualification for that institution and that might be your guide or your pathway to take 
uh, a decision. And I'm sure that if you want to become uh, an English teacher, you'll be as happy as Edward and I am. Yes. It's taken a bit effort. Yeah, a real big effort because of the past, I think, three or four years, I've been working seven days a week on online projects, etc. But uh, it's really rewarding when you've got uh, active students and that you see your students grow. So that's the rewarding part and that keeps you going. Yes, and it is a step-to-step -step, uh, career. Yes, and also what I would like to um, to mention, because you mentioned here that you've got uh, intermediate courses. Uh, if you have got, uh, for example, the level PET, that's from, uh, from Cambridge, uh, a lot of teachers at uh, primary and secondary schools have got PET as, as, the, as their level. Ideally is that you continue studying in order to to increase your level. So ideally would be minimum for a certificate or the CAE and with TOEFL that would be like uh, 600 points each. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the computer-based TOEFL that would be like 90 points. Mm -hmm. Are there any, any other questions? There aren't any other questions. Well, we thank Angelica Flores and Jasmine for having been interacting with us, stating these questions. And we wish you a great experience, a great continuum in this updating and uh, develop yourself because pride at the end is great if you feel that you are doing things in a better way. Yes, absolutely. and continuing developing yourself having more theory makes you also feel much more confident and uh, then you uh, are much better at detecting the real needs of your students for example for example at companies uh, i work a lot on persuasive speaking because a common problem is that people say uh, um, people just don't listen to me during the meetings and then you have to tell them that it's because they are boring to listen to and at first they take it it's a big shock and then you explain to them that when you don't make use of intonation you don't transmit the message and when you don't transmit message uh, there's no there's no input so it's boring so they say i heard the words that you say but what is the the message that you want to put across what is your opinion about it so with the use of intonation you can become persuasive yes and, and, and to 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 convey the needs and the interest of the students and make uh, the teaching authentic and uh, significant yes. usable effective and as you mentioned, uh, make, make the teaching authentic. Um, addressing the real needs of the students also means that you've got to bring authentic material of the field of study they are, uh, they are working on, because that's meaningful input. So when you re bring real articles, the level of English can be much higher and students don't feel <clears throat> Um, don't feel it as a burden, but they are really engaged in uh, getting to understand the concept because you only need about 80% of, um, of, the, of the context to understand, 20% of the words that you don't understand, and you still have a very good idea what the, the text is about. And the activities can be based on uh, okay, write, make a glossary of at least 10 words that you find difficult or that you find that are important for other students uh, to know in order to understand the text better. Exactly, thank you very much. I think everybody. there's another question uh, coming our way. Yes, well, <coughs> probably the last question. 
Thank you. I very don't know. Much. We've got about twenty minutes in total for the yes for the questions. All right. Shall I take it, or yes, would you uh, like to take no, it? Please take it. Which have been your particular areas of expertise in terms of English teaching, Rosalba? Ah, really good question, Rosalba. And I'm thinking about how to answer. I think I'll answer in terms of uh, the latest time. Uh, my areas of expertise has been into online teaching. Uh, and I think, Edward, you shared this with me. We have learned how to cope with the different uh, problems and also solutions when doing online teaching. For instance, drop, dropping out from a course, from a face-to-face -face course, is less dramatic than in online courses. What do we do with the missing in action? What do we do with those that drop out easily in online courses? Well, we have had to read about it and to, I, I keep a humanistic approach when dealing with online teaching. I don't know if you have another yes. particular area that you would like to talk about. Mm, yeah, but I would also like to comment something on, uh, regarding the online teaching because for a lot of people, uh, a lot of people think that online learning is a cold environment. So with uh, the, yeah, the professional development, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're offered an online course, people feel put off because it's cold. Uh, I would say it's rather the opposite because as we are certified online uh, tutors, we learned how to detect if something's wrong with the student because you all of a sudden see a difference in, uh, in online behavior. So one active student that always answers all the questions all of a sudden uh, only works 20% or the tone becomes really hostile and really bitter. So then you know you have to step in and ask if they need uh, some, some help, if everything is okay, because in most cases uh, they've got family problems or other problems. And well, other areas of expertise, um, yeah, one expertise area is business English and I really love uh, teaching business English because uh, dealing with um, people at companies and especially directors, I get a clear picture of what the, um, what the companies want the, the people to know. So when I, when I train my teachers, I, I pass that knowledge on to the teachers, like uh, be aware, make sure that your students get competent at for example, intercultural mm -hmm. competences, because it's nowadays it's uh, really uh, important to, to know about different cultures. Rosalba, I started, one of my, my first areas of expertise was ESP, English for Specific Purposes, in veterinary medicine. And I, I taught, I am still teaching reading comprehension. And uh, I have made lots of changes because at first I thought I needed to teach only speaking English. And then uh, I faced that I had to use Spanish. The instructions should be in Spanish to later on go and tackle the text, uh, let's say in a more feasible way because students were confident of what to do and the text was the, the challenge, not the instructions in English. So I, I, have, I have changed. And from that area of expertise, I, I went into online. And the, I cannot call myself really an expert or a specialist. I'm, I'm developing. I am continuously developing. Thank you for asking, Rosalba. Yes, and <clears throat> OK. So let's thank everybody for um, yeah, for their attention, and it was uh, yeah, it was really a pleasure to to be able to be able to deliver this um, webinar. So thank you very much, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.